Hi everyone, and welcome back to Advancing with Watercolor. I'm Gary Tucker. The painting you see behind me is an extension of a painting we started last week. If you have a chance, I recommend you view the painting that we did last week, a tonal version of this painting, uh, based on a shop in Venice. This shop restores gondolas, repairs them, and uh, builds new ones as well. In the painting last week, we developed a tonal study, a tonal pattern, unifying the lights and darks throughout the painting. And we extend that in this week's painting, only we use color. One of the things I, I want to demonstrate is the setting of the high notes or the bright tones, the bright colors in this painting um, in the beginning stages. Uh, in addition to this painting, there's a PDF that you can download. It's in the description uh, below the file, below the video. So take time to look at the description. Also, there's a reference to the materials that I'm using, colors, brushes, etc. And if you follow this uh, video to the end, you'll see a link to uh, related videos as well as a link to uh, the, the finished painting. So join me as we develop this image in color. I'd like to start by showing you the tonal study next to the color version so that you can see how I use the same strategy of connecting mid-tones and darks and even lights through the painting. Then we're going to get into the painting of the subject. And I'm starting with um, yellow ochre and a big mop brush. I'm working on 140 pound uh, Saunders Waterford, which has a nice tooth to it. I like to use this paper or arches, 140 pound rough. And you can notice the incline that I'm working on, the incline of my table. It's quite steep, maybe um, 70 degrees or so. And my palette as well is on an incline, and part of that is to the reason behind that is to show you how diluted the color is. Um, if you notice how it falls down the palette when I mix it up, that's telling you it's quite diluted as it is now. And uh, in working with the big brush, I can, I can cover the paper relatively quickly and in a very uh, saturated manner so that when I want to go back in and add some color, adjust the color, I can do that and, and the color is going to react as a wet and wet wash. So here you see I'm creating the, the face of the building and the entrance or the, the uh, front of the, the shop. And I'm using a lot of yellow ochre. I go back in and add some siennas as well as um, some reds later on. Right now I'm going to finish the lower section by introducing a green. This green is cobalt turquoise and um, the source photo if you saw it um, in the last video is the water appears very blue that's because it's reflecting the sky but in truth it's it's quite green. So I'm using that green as sort of a foundation cobalt turquoise mixed with a little bit of yellow ochre. And then I return to the still wet area and one of the reasons I'm showing you this camera angle is so that you can see how wet the paper is. It's very shiny that tells you it's it's still very saturated and that means to the watercolorist that we can still work it. It's when it loses that shine that we have to be a little careful. So Noticing that it's still very shiny, I'm adding some burnt sienna, I'm adding some cad red again to the wall of the building and just adding a few um, areas of brighter, thicker color to create a variety on the face of the building. Well, I've let the paper dry and you can see it's dried to pretty close to the way it looked when I was painting it, not much variation, but you can see where I added the reds and the siennas and the greens to that yellow ochre and how they spread out. Now my approach is uh, going for that mid-tone and so I'm working much thicker 
if you look at the palette you can notice that the color is not traveling downwards so readily it's staying pretty much where um, I have mixed the pigment that tells you that it's much thicker still using a big brush and still holding it back um, towards the end of the brush because I want to keep it <clears throat> keep the strokes um, calligraphic and at the same time uh, not uh, thinking about detail too much not defining too many areas just yet still working in a sort of broad general manner and relying on the big brush is one way to do this if you find in your painting that you're getting bogged down in detail one way to remedy that is to just move to a bigger brush this will in essence ask you to think about bigger passages and connecting passages and not allow you to dwell into the the small details there is a time for detail that's towards the end of the painting we'll switch to a smaller brush and start to manipulate it the detail so I'm staying within this area and it's a little hard to notice but I've used <clears throat> more warm hues uh, in the shadow area and I'm using more cobalt blue I'm sorry ultramarine blue and a bit of that cobalt turquoise mixed with uh, some burnt sienna and the bolt uh, that I'm painting now as well as the um, stand that it's resting on and uh, I'm going to continue to move that combination of colors towards the left of the painting joining this strong mid-tone as I move across you notice that I keep a few brushes in my hand that allows me to move quickly um, through the painting and in this way I can kind of keep my pace and I've noticed for myself in my work that keeping um, a sort of tempo helps me with the the brushwork um, and so I keep moving even if I I see a passage that I want to stop and correct um, I'll kind of bookmark, bookmark that in my mind and then move on towards the rest of the painting, dropping colors, placing brush strokes, and try to keep a sort of tempo through this area. One um, aspect that I forgot to mention that I'll mention now uh, in laying in that first wash is that uh, I isolate the whites or the brighter uh, the brightest parts of the painting you'll notice they appear very readily right now as uh, shirts on the characters that are to the back and left as well as the top of the main gondola and this is the way that I like to sort of set a, a focal point is if I'm going to be working with a large dark mid-tone I want to isolate those whites which can be refined, they can be made smaller, but it's uh, kind of better to start with a large general area of white and then refine it as you refine the painting. So the whites will remain uh, for the most part white through the whole painting. Another way to approach this, another technical way you can think, uh, approach leaving whites is by using masking fluid. Um, I don't enjoy working with masking fluid, so I've developed my technique more along the lines of creating a few shapes that I'm going to leave white, and also sometimes my brush uh, skips along and leaves whites accidentally, and I'm not in a hurry to cover those up. Sometimes they end up being very useful in a painting. So my strategy for leaving whites is to actually leave the white of the paper and paint around it in the early stages and then refine it as I move, as I refine the painting. Still thinking very broadly, you can see how I've connected both of the boats, the boat that's coming towards us as well as the one that's moving to the side, a doorway, um, 
above the second boat and I'm going to continue to carry this sort of mid-tone uh, through the whole painting, painting a shadow area using a bit more blue, a bit more of that ultramarine blue in the shadow to distinguish it from the boat and also create a, a reference to the blue and green that appears um, as a minor color throughout the painting. The major color in this this painting is probably that foundation color of that warm brownish hue and I'll be adjusting that but this remains sort of the mother color if you will the color that is dominating the painting uh, with a minor hue of this cobalt turquoise and um, they harmonize well with each other partially because the the brownish hue of burnt sienna primarily has a red aspect to it and Cobalt turquoise has a greenish feel to it, so they are natural complements to each other. And this is uh, one of the strategies that I use when thinking about color is in the beginning I try to squint my eyes and look for a hue that's really uh, dominating the scene. And I make a note of that. I also make a note of the complement to that hue. In this case, it's red and green, even though we're using um, variations on that. That doesn't mean we don't use other colors, but identifying the, the major color and sort of its minor uh, complement is a very useful strategy. It also simplifies the process in if you get lost in color, you can always kind of return to this idea of the major color and its minor complement to get you out of trouble. We'll look at how the dark uh, darks are also being made of um, burnt sienna or ultramarine blue, um, mixing them together on the palette and sometimes favoring the blue, sometimes favoring the burnt sienna, uh, burnt sienna, so that there's this play back and forth of warm and cool. Uh, while it's muted, it's quite muted. As the paint dries, we'll notice that more and more. And now we're finishing the lower section with more blue, more turquoise, and quite thick, and leaving a nice rough edge where the water kind of laps up against the incline so that we get a feeling of a slope. The, the shadow helps that, but uh, also the slight angle that we're using and the soft edge that we're giving the water helps us to understand that this is a slope coming towards us. So I returned and painted a few extra darks into the boats uh, even using some very strong neutral tint in this forward boat to really make it come forward. But I want to show you a technique for creating um, a kind of weathered feel to the wood. I'm mixing up burnt sienna, a little bit of uh, ultramarine blue to gray it. And then I take a lot of the pigment out of my brush. And I, I go to the rough paper that's fully dry. And I look at how the brush has kind of frayed and giving me a very um, uncharacteristic quality, but this is useful in dry brush to create a rough pattern. And it works well, it harmonizes well with the underpainting, which was largely warm hues, and we leave some of those exposed to give a kind of sheen to the wood, uh, but this is a, a stage where now we are really starting to see those whites jump out and we're starting to feel sunlight on the pavement below and on our figures the shadows are starting to resonate uh, so the painting is starting to just at this point starting to present a finished quality and that tells me that um, I, I exercise a little more judgment with anything that I add after this uh, I look, uh, try to use my my vision to see if I if a, a touch will work here or an accent there. I know that I need to refine the characters a little bit, but in essence, the painting is 
is finished. And so I'm, I'm uh, looking for smaller brushwork. You can tell I'm holding the brush way up on the furrow and finishing the painting and remembering at the same time what a joyous time it was to be painting in front of this beautiful spot in Venice. Well, that about sums it up. Thanks for watching. And watch to the end of this video because you'll see a playlist uh, that links similar vi videos that I've created along the lines of color. Also, check out the description below because there's important information on the materials I use. And there's a PDF that uh, elaborates on some of the things that I'm talking about during this video. Next week, I'm going to be in Venice again, and I'm going to be painting Reflections on a Canal. So I hope you'll join me.